centers. And also, I've been working with WHO, uh, TDR, IDR, different, uh, or, uh, different uh, subsections of WHO for the past 12 years as a GCP monitor. So I've been monitoring a lot of clinical trials on both vaccines and drugs for WHO in the past 12 years. So part of my actually maybe interest was because of you know, being involved in that type of research that uh, maybe brought me to this type of work. Uh, so that's, that's I think, um, I'm Tom Lang. I am a uh, self-employed medical writer editor. I do a lot of author's editing. Uh, I joined AMWA in the early 1980s and have been active in that organization ever since. I am currently the treasurer of the World Association of Medical Editors and a past president of the Council of Science Editors. Uh, my interest is in space <coughs> medicine. Uh, I've served on the consort Moose Prisma FAPS group. We'll talk about what the initials mean at some point. Uh, and so my, my area of interest is scientific publications and writing and editing to meet the, the needs of evidence-based medicine. Thank you. I'm, I'm worried now because I've got two microphones. Okay. Um, I'm Julia Donnelly. I'm UK-based. Um, and I, I'm also independent. Um, I am a PhD pharmacist by trade and have worked in the pharmaceutical industry um, for a few years. Then I worked in medical communications for 12 years and then I have worked for myself for the past 11 years, I think, nearly 12 years. Um, so I work predominantly, as I said before, in publication planning. So I'm actually employed as an out-contracted publication planning manager. Right, publication manager, which I've been doing for the last 11 years. So it means that on one hand, I sit within industry and I have an industry email, but on the other hand, I'm freelance. So I, I, I'm, I think I'm quite privileged in that I'm in this situation where I'm both. So although I have a company email address, and at times when I've worked for multiple companies, I've had several pharmaceutical company email addresses. Um, I've also been able to work for myself as well and work for other clients. So I, I feel this, I'm, I'm quite lucky in being able to see the different initiatives and, and the different um, issues that, that people face for where they work. So in fact, I'm, I'm going to promote them more yet again. Uh, this year we're introducing some expert sessions and I'm running on one on the client freelancer relationship because I think it's really interesting because on one hand you've got freelancers who are thinking well why don't the clients do this and on the other hand there's clients who think I'm not going to give a freelancer some work because of these reasons and I think it's an area that we need to discuss so, so that's um, that's why I'm interested in that because I actually work in, in both areas I've worked in regulatory writing um, I've worked predominantly in communication writing, most therapeutic areas. Um, again, I'm, I'm, I feel really privileged because I'm, I'm very interested in evidence-based medicine as well, but I, I don't know a lot about it, so I think I'm going to learn a whole lot over the next two days. Thank you very much. Uh, is there any questions or comments? Yes, we can. Professional medical writers have become an identity in itself. They have their own life. What about the ethical aspects of it? Professional medical writers, now they write for the researchers, academician, industry as well. Yes. But some people do object yes. that they shouldn't be doing it. They are ghost writers. Exactly. So where do you place it from professional ethics point of view? Right. I think if you look at a lot of the guidelines, they, they do recognize the need of professional medical writers. Um, because I think, you know, I think probably some of the, well, certainly some of the investigators that I work with would be the first to admit they're busy seeing patients and, and doing their day job. They don't really have the time to write some of these very involved publications. And so they're very willing to work with a publication writer. However, I think that the thing that you, 
what has to happen is you have to be transparent about it. And that's what these guidelines are all about. We, if I work as a medical writer, in fact, if I work as a publication planner on a publication that I've managed, I have to be acknowledged. My name has to be in that paper. And it says there that I wrote the paper, and it says that I was paid by the pharmaceutical company that I'm working for. And it is there in black and white, and it is it's so transparent. transparent. But I, I think it has to be that way. I, and also, I think as a, you know, you, as somebody that, that works with a lot of freelance or out-contracted publication writers, you obviously get good ones and you obviously get bad ones as well. And the good ones are the ones that are proactive and know about the regulations and know what's required and very happy to have their names on it. There's very few now, well, there, there will be some that, that don't operate so um, ethically, but I think the, the clients soon find out who they are and they wouldn't work. But, but you have to be transparent. I'd like to just add a little bit to that. It seems to me that the real problem with ghostwriting is when a marketing department at a pharmaceutical company hires a medical communications company to develop, uh, say, a review article. And now you've got a case where the medical communication companies are serving clients, not science. And so the bias that's instilled by um, the ghostwriter at the medical communications company is such that we will tell our client whatever they want to hear, uh, whether or not the data support that or not. Uh, but I think you'll find most of the, the charges of, uh, of ghostwriting in things like review articles or editorials, not so much the reporting of the scientific research itself. Uh, and I would echo Julia's comment that medical writing is a necessary and desirable service. I can write a draft of a scientific article faster, better, and cheaper than any of my authors can. And that saves them money, and it saves them time. <clears throat> and as long as I work under their direction so that they have complete control over the information that goes into that article, um, I think that's a very good thing to have. <clears throat> um, uh, Farhad has asked about the, the difference between a medical writer and a medical editor. It's the spelling of the word. Um, <clears throat> I bill myself as a medical editor, but medical editing and medical rewriting are very similar. Uh, can I take information and turn it into an article that way? Yes, so that would be medical writing. Uh, I, I see it as a, a spectrum, and even though I do mostly editing, I do a lot of rewriting, and occasionally I will be writing. And, and to me, that's all the same sort of test. Thank you. I was actually going to make a point first, going back to your question as well, which is about the Sunshine Act in, in the States, and we'll touch on that later, um, and about the fact of, of recording transfer of value. And now, um, working on, on the pharmaceutical side, I have to record any medical writing that I do and that has to be then allocated to any uh, US healthcare professional. So, so the value, so not only would my name be <coughs> recorded in the publication that I'd have helped, but also the value that was associated with the time that I spent medical writing would also then be attributed to, to each of these US healthcare professionals as well. So that's another, another um, aspect of transparency. In terms of the, the very good question of medical writing and medical editors, I'm, I'm pleased to know what the difference is because um, I've, I've always struggled with that one. I think I always, when I used to work in an agency, we had writers, which I was one, and we had editors. And um, the editors were the people that you gave something to and they used to pick holes in it and say, you haven't got enough spaces and this doesn't look right and that doesn't look right. And that, that is where I always thought that's what editors did, but I know that, that that's not the case. I know that the spectrum is right over the other side. And um, yeah, I think, I think the spectrum, it is a spectrum. Probably it starts with a blank piece of paper, which is where the writer is, and then at which point it switches to an editor. editor. I 
really don't know. Thank you very much. I think uh, just in our region, we still have this problem because it's, uh, you know, we have medical writing groups uh, are not very prevalent here, and we're not very familiar with it, and we tried to introduce it here to make it more professional. What we have mostly, in, I think, in the Middle East and the Eastern Mediterranean region is that people who have a really good knowledge of English, they have a little bit of knowledge of research, and they try to help others, you know, but you know, they're not that professional in a sense. And I think we have to build upon that professionalism, and I think this is what we're going to try to do in the future, is we have to have professional medical writers who are really trained for it, who are updated, who go for courses, they attend workshops. Because at this stage, we have a lot of people who are helping other people, but maybe they're not doing it the right way. But I also believe myself that you know, we still should have our own people start writing as well. And we have to start to do that from even high school. You know, because the tradition in the Middle East is mostly verbal. And we talk a lot, we give a lot of, you know, uh, you know there's a lot of things that we do. Uh, we, we do it, it's our, our, our tradition is more like oral tradition in a sense, and we don't have that much written tradition. Maybe I mean, we do, but we don't really base it that much on it. So I think we have to start to, to write better, and we have to do it from, you know, an early age. And I think this instruction now in, in, uh, in Shiraz, we have a, actually a master course medical journalism right now and we also are having courses for our MD students and even for even uh, trying to put them into high school some courses on how to write a letter paper how to prepare a paper I think th these are important you, know, you have to try to do it yourself as well and then try to get the help of other people and try to get better it's true that we don't have sometimes the time but that still doesn't make you know uh, it's not you still have to do it because you have to know how to do it and then maybe get the help uh, later on to make it much better and perfect it and then uh, as they say because sometimes you know you really run into some big trials and you really need some help but I think this is also an important thing that we have to develop in this region to try to to, to open up this concept and try to move it forward uh, and to discuss it again amongst ourselves. Any comments? Any, any more comments or questions? Yeah, I would like to add some point on what Tom and Julia was talking about and even Tom was so uh, I'm basically a professional medical writer and I also uh, get from the medical journalist. So uh, the, the most important thing is where you place, uh, how uh, transparent you are in acknowledging the use of the medical writer and the funding for the medical writer. So this should be explicitly mentioned in the institution or organization uh, for publication policy. So what we follow in our organization is we have a streamlined publication policy where in which we strictly follow ICMJ and GDP to guidelines in acknowledging all the contributors, including the authors and any other uh, non-other contributors in the acknowledgement section, mentioning uh, the role of medical writer and the funding for the medical writer. I think that should be the key point uh, which all medical writing of agencies or medical writers should follow in order to be more transparent. Thank you. Any more uh, comments? Questions, comments? So, uh, It's okay that we uh, just move on to the next session and uh, uh, Tom will be Tom, uh, in the US will be speaking on basics and advances of statistics in medicine. Please Tom. How many of you are pretty much definitely afraid of statistics? This is an honest group. It's an honest group. <laughs> How many of you are deathly afraid of statistics but aren't going to raise your hand in front of your friends? It usually gets everybody else. Okay. As I mentioned, I'm a medical writer and editor. I'm not a statistician. But I used to be the manager of medical editing services at the Cleveland Clinic Foundation. How many of you have heard of the Mayo Clinic? Okay, that's the other clinic in the Midwest in America. The Cleveland Clinic, uh, where I worked, is where cardiac bypass surgery was invented, 
coronary angiography was invented there. Um, so we are two years younger than the Mayo Clinic, but half the size, and the Mayo Clinic has a better public relations department than we do. When I was at the Cleveland Clinic, it occurred to me that if I was ever going to be any good as a medical writer, I needed to know something about statistics. And to make a very long, painful story very short, I ended up writing a book called How to Report Statistics in Medicine. And what I have for you now are some of the key concepts of reporting statistics in medicine. Um, I don't know how to calculate statistics, but I do know how to interpret them, and I do know how to report them, so that's what we'll talk about. Um, this is the book. Um, <clears throat> this is a comprehensive set of guidelines for reporting statistics uh, in clinical journals, basically. Uh, it has several chapters on the, sort of the mathematical statistics and then several chapters for reporting research designs and activities, randomized trials, economic evaluations, and so forth. Uh, a little review of statistics in, in uh, medical journals. Three basic problems. And the first problem is that a lot of authors use only basic statistics if they use any at all. Uh, this is sort of a, a very quick summary of the problem. Uh, it's up to 80% of journals in some fields um, use no descriptive statistics or only descriptive statistics, mean, range, that sort of thing. Uh, most importantly for our purposes is that most of these articles contain statistical methods that are taught in the first semester of statistics. Now I teach a three-day course at the University of Chicago and in those three days we cover the statistics that you need to understand about 80 to 90 percent of the statistics in the medical literature. And it's not because I'm so good at teaching, I would like to think that I am. It's because there are very few statistical methods used, and the ones used tend to be very basic. So with a little bit of uh, effort, uh, we can learn how to interpret and report statistics uh, to a very high degree. Uh, the 20% the of articles that are hard using advanced statistics, again, it's not hard for us to, uh, to learn to understand these things and to report them. But this is, I think, what's, what's driving medical research. You have to have an advanced statistical uh, skills to do good research today. This is the second problem. Authors who use statistics make lots of mistakes. My book was written basically from a comprehensive review of studies on statistical errors in the literature. And I reviewed probably 350 of these studies. Uh, none of them, absolutely none, said we found really good results. And in fact, overall, um, <coughs> about half of the articles that use statistics have errors in them. And more often than not, those errors are so serious as to call the author's conclusions into question. So there's a real problem. 10% uh, have fatal flaws. They should never have been published. Uh, this is a 10% figure has been constant since about the 1960s when the first of these studies um, came out. How many of you know the Cochrane collaboration, the Cochrane Library? Good. Okay. 30% of the Cochrane reviews have errors in them, serious errors in them. And the bias is always toward the, the intervention that's being tested. So, we have a real problem with doing quality statistical work. And the third problem, getting ahead of myself here. Uh, in fact, the problem of poor statistical reporting is widespread. It has been found in every journal studied in every country uh, in which journals have been published, every branch of medicine. It's long standing. The first p value appears in mid 1930s. Uh, the first studies of statistical errors begin to appear in the mid-1960s, um, and they've all found 
horrible rates of, of errors. It's potentially serious because if the author's conclusions are questionable, we don't have a lot of faith in the science that's being reported. Uh, and it's largely unknown. How many of you thought until just 30 seconds ago that the medical literature was in pretty good shape and that you could believe what you read? Okay? I hate to be the one to break the news to you, but this is why we have to know something about statistics because we have to know if we can believe what we're reading. Uh, and finally, these errors concern basic statistics and not, not advanced ones. Okay, much of the literature can't be trusted. And the third problem is that nobody is doing very much about the first two. So, with that, we'll go on. How many of you are journal editors? Okay. How many of you are medical writer editors? Um, I know my friend Shi Hong and Angela from China are uh, medical English teachers. They've come a long way to be here. It's good to see you again. Um, how many of you teach English or medical English? Okay. Uh, how many of you are physicians who are beginning to do research? Okay. And how many of you were here because you couldn't find the nutrition conference? <laughs> okay. <clears throat> well, one of the things that we need to deal with is, is unnecessary precision. Uh, so my, my favorite here is uh, the mean age of our sample was 34.81 years. How long is 81 one hundredths of a year? Anybody? Okay. Um, the point is, we don't think in terms of 81 one hundredths of a year. And probably, we can call the mean age here of 35 years. Do we have to be that precise all the time? If you need the precision, use it. Uh, but my research indicates that we want to round probably to two digits if we can. Uh, for reasons that I'll show you in just a moment. Uh, this is also the smallest p-value that needs to be reported. My record is from one of my Japanese authors who routinely gives me p-values to six decimal places. <clears throat> okay, most of us can really understand numbers of only two digits. So here's a little test. The number of women rose from 29,942 94,347, and the number of men rose from 13,410 to 36,051. What's the approximate increase between the first number and the second number? I'm sorry you had your chance. Let's give you another chance. We're going to round by one digit, see if that makes a difference. The number of women rose from 29,900 to 94,300, and the number of men rose from 13,400 to 36,000. Now what's the approximate increase? Three times. Three times. Three times. Three times. Very good. Very good. It's easier to see the threefold increase when you get rid of all the extra numbers. So psychologically, we can really handle only uh, two digits easily. And if we can use get to two digits legitimately, we should do that. If you need the precision, report the precision. I don't want to make light of that. But if you can round, think about it. Uh, this is one of my favorite topics. Many research projects have as an outcome not the number of patients that gets well or survives, but rather changes in blood values or hormone levels or, or this sort of thing. And we need to know, what this is called the unit of observation. Are we studying patients or are we studying blood values? But we also have the concept of pairing, so that data from one person pretest should be kept connected with 
the patient from post-test, so that there's a relationship there. And with this chart, I can prove anything I want. You can see the pre-test values and the post-test values. And let's suppose that an increase is a very good thing. I could say, look, 68% of my patients improved. Am I correct? Yes. Okay. Suppose a decrease is a good thing. Well, I can say, look, you know, my drug reduced the mean from 11.6 to 10. Is that correct? Yes. There are two problems here. One is that you can see that one patient made all the difference. And in a paired analysis, both of those values will be linked statistically so that we don't have this apparent confusion here. And the second point is that notice that when we compare the means, we get one response, but when we look at the number of patients who improved or did not improve, we get a second response. So we have to keep paired data paired, and we have to look for how many patients improved or not, as well as uh, the, the blood value, for example. Okay, how many of you know that the mean and standard deviation are appropriate only for reporting normally distributed data? Good. You all remember your statistics class, right? Now, my guess is that all of you had at least one statistics class? Uh huh? Yes. Okay, and the only thing you remember about that was that P less than 0.05 is good, right? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Well, the other thing that you should have learned was that uh, if the data are normally distributed, mean and standard deviation are appropriate. Um, if the data are skewed, then probably the median and the interquartile range are appropriate. And this is just a summary of that normal uh, distribution. So 68% of the data in a normally normal distribution are within one standard deviation on either side and so forth. Most of you remember that. If I were to give you a mean and a standard deviation to communicate the data that I had collected, you could legitimately draw any of those six distributions and be correct because they all have the same mean and the same standard deviation. So by convention and by definition, only the normal distribution is adequately described with the mean and standard deviation. That's probably the second most common statistical error in the literature, is describing skewed data with the mean and the standard deviation. What's wrong with this table? I know I'm asking you to work here. And you know, this is an afternoon, it's a nice lunch, it's hot, and you're learning about statistics, right? This is not a real good time for that. But take a look at the table and analyze it, tell me what's wrong. We have a mean of 10 and a standard deviation of 11. Yes, the standard deviation is bigger than the mean. This is a problem because it means that they are skewed. The author is telling us that the mean, uh, mean um, strength was 10 kilograms, and that 68% of all the data lie between 21 kilograms and minus 1 kilograms. Can you have minus 1 kilograms? You can if you're in physical therapy. I learned that the hard way. Like the Cybex machines, you know, you could have a negative strength in physical therapy. But other than that, you can't. So here's what happens. The round line is the data the authors actually collected. They described it with a mean and standard deviation, as everybody does. But if you plot that the way it was supposed to be plotted, you see that there are impossible values if you use the definition of a normal curve. So here's the rule. When the standard deviation is greater than about half the mean, the data are skewed. And you should probably describe them with the median and the interquartile range. Any questions on that? 
I've explained it perfectly. I love it when that happens. This is the problem. Most biological data are not normally distributed, which means we should be seeing a lot more of median tenor to quartile ranges and a lot fewer of means and standard deviations. How many of you have read in a scientific article a sentence that says, the data conformed to the assumptions of the tests used to analyze them? How many journal editors insist that such a statement be there? Okay, that's what I thought. My research says that any paper that uses a statistical test should have a statement that says the assumptions of the test were verified and checked and that they were um, correct. Strangely enough, the assumption most often violated is that the data are considered to be normally distributed when they're not. And as we talked about before, uh, that data are analyzed as being independent of one another rather than paired. We are actually paired data. Uh, one of the, how many of you know the consort statements? Consolidated standards of reporting trials, randomized trials. Okay, this is the first of what I would call the, the standards movement, a uh, set of guidelines for reporting uh, medical research. And in the consort statement is the requirement for what I would call a visual summary. Everybody else calls it a flow chart. I call it a visual summary because it's a visual summary, not a flow chart. Uh, it summarizes the study design. It tells the number of patients at each stage of the research and <clears throat> allows us to identify important uh, proportions and um, numerators and denominators. So here's a simple visual summary. We started with 89 patients, five were excluded, uh, and we ended up with 84 being assigned. As an editor, the very first thing I'm going to do is add 84 and five and expect to get 89. When I was at the Cleveland Clinic, we had the suspicion that there were mistakes going on. And we tested it, and sure enough, two-thirds of the papers we received were edited. And this is from all departments, all medical departments. Two-thirds of those papers had mathematical errors that we as editors could detect with a calculator. This isn't statistical analysis. This is just addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division. Check the numbers. One of my uh, interns from China, uh, <clears throat> or he was a, a student of mine in China, who did an internship in the United States at the, Na the Journal of the National Cancer uh, Institute. And he was the official number checker. Every paper that um, this journal published, he was given in draft form, and his job was to verify every number he could verify in that paper. So he checked all the math. If there was a range of normal values, he would check to make sure that was really the normal range. Uh, but that's the kind of review that you need to really get the numbers correct. Now notice that we've got the treatment and the control group. It's a two-arm trial, you can see that. Uh, you can put the results in here, the number of complete healers, you can put a confidence interval and in p-value if you wanted to. Very, very useful uh, tool. Now why do we call these treatment arms? I don't know either, I was just hoping you could tell me. I've always wondered why they were called treatment arms and not treatment legs. Now most of you remember basic medicine with the diagnostic testing, right? You, you give somebody a test and it's positive or negative. <clears throat> well, there's a category of test results that are indeterminate, intermediate, or uninterpretable. And this is what happens when the test doesn't go the way it's supposed to. So an intermediate result, maybe the positive test is a blue cell, a cell that stays blue, but you look at the slide and the cell is not dark blue, it's bluish. So it's sort of intermediate between the dark blue of a positive test and the clear of a negative test. An indeterminate test result gives you, you know, conflicting information. Suppose you did a survey uh, looking for the prevalence of alcoholism. And some of the questionnaires 
who come back with evidence of uh, alcoholism and in the same questionnaire evidence that would work against the definition of alcoholism. So you don't know what you have because you have um, indeterminate results. Uninterpretable results, the test wasn't uh, completed as planned and followed protocol. Here's the problem. Do you all remember this table for calculating sensitivity and specificity? My guess is that you do. But notice that on this table there's no place for equivocal test results. Now when I was working on the book, I didn't know much about um, this stuff, and so I went to the Department of Biostatistics at the clinic, which had 100 people in it, people um, several PhDs and, and master's level statisticians, and I said, what do you guys do with equivocal test results? And they said, oh, we throw them out. Well, you're not supposed to throw them out. You're supposed to tell us how many equivocal test results you have uh, and what kind of uh, equivocal test results. Because you could have a really good test, but if you have to throw out 95 of every 100, maybe it's not such a good test. So when you read an article about diagnostic testing, think about equivocal results. We also need to be very suspicious of graphs, uh, especially misleading graphs. Uh, the first one I have for you is called the lost zero problem. What's the relationship between the data on the left and the data on the right? Sorry? It's a magnitude of the x-axis. It's the same It's the same Yes. Yes, very good. Yeah, the, both, both graphs show the same data. The values are the same. But because we are um, psychologically driven, optically, and in, in terms of interpretation, if you show somebody this image, what they will remember is that the yellow column was four-fifths the height of the orange column. That's not the truth, but that's the visual truth that they will remember. The truth, the visual truth is over here, where it's <clears throat> the yellow column is about 80% of the orange column. Now sometimes you can't start at zero. The scale doesn't allow it. In which case, the approved version is to break not only the scale, but the data field so that there's no doubt because everybody will assume that the graph starts at a zero point. So we have to be careful for that because sometimes it's not done. Here's another fun example. What's the relationship between these three graphs? They're the same, right? They all graph the same data. This is called